Oh, good evening. I am Brian Clark. Um, and for those of you who have attended these TEDx salons in the past, I may very well be the most amateur speaker that you've ever encountered. Um, I've been with Generations for 20 years, but until I was the executive director, I really didn't have much cause to, to do much public speaking, which honestly suited me just fine because I spent the better part of my life trying to avoid speaking in public. Um, the climax of, of that anxiety occurred my freshman year at Clemson University. I was in my English class the first day and the professor handed out the syllabus and I was looking it over and it had the list of all the tests we would have to take and all the projects that were due and how this would all account for our grades. And my eyes very quickly honed in on two words, which was oral presentation. And I immediately began to sweat. The collar of my t-shirt felt really tight. The date was assigned for in November, and this was August. So I had plenty of time to put it out of my mind and, and not worry about it. But I promise you, every day when I went into that English class, I thought about that presentation. I was anxious about it. It was always there. It was always looming. So when the day of my presentation came, I was prepared. I had written a great speech. I felt very good about the content. However, I did not feel very good about the chances of me getting in front of the class, presenting it without fainting or <laughs> running out of the room crying. Um, so I did what any other coward would do. I cut class. <laughs> and uh, I called my professor the next day and said, uh, I was sick, I couldn't make it, and she said she understood, and it was up to me to reschedule my presentation. And of course, I made no effort to do that. And um, I took a zero at the end of the semester. I got a zero for the speech that I never made. My final grade dropped from an A to a C. And the most embarrassing thing about that is that at the time, it was totally worth it. It was totally worth it. So. The fact that I'm standing here speaking to you right now, and I'm not in my car speeding down Augusta Road, <laughs> driving home, is because over the years, I've developed self-efficacy. And so right now, my wife is sitting right there, and she's thinking to herself, what does self-efficacy mean again? I know this because that's what she said when I told her what I was going to talk about today. And so, darling, self-efficacy is one's belief in his or her ability to accomplish a task. In short, it's our confidence in our ability to be successful at things we try to do. And honestly, it's one of the most important components in anyone trying to accept a challenge, trying to do anything. When we try something new, when we accept a challenge, when we try to learn new skills, there's risk involved. There's risk of failure. And everything that goes along with that, embarrassment, disappointment, rejection, we all do better with these risks when we're surrounded by people who we have strong relationships with. When we, when we have people in our lives who, who pick us up, who try to make us better, who encourage us, who help us when we fail. When people believe in us, we believe in ourselves. And this is true of all of you. I'm sure you can all sit here right now and think about people in your lives who got you where you are today, people that you credit for who you are. Maybe it's your parents, maybe it's a teacher, a mentor. We all have people who have helped us to become the people that we are today. Now, I've worked with children for 20 years, over 20 years now. And when I tell people this, the conversation often goes something like this. Oh, that's great, you work with kids, I love kids. Yeah, I, I love kids too, um, but uh, you know, I don't really work with church, kid, church groups. This is, a, uh, this is a pretty tough group of kids that I work with. Oh, you mean you work with kids who've been, been in trouble, like in school? Um, yeah, some of them have been in trouble with school, but actually all of the kids that I work with have sexual behavior problems. Oh, sexual behavior problems. Um, you mean they've been sexually abused? Well, yeah, some of them have been sexually abused, but all of the kids that we work with have sexually abused others. Oh, 
Well, that's interesting. And it's funny, not funny, interesting, how the tone of that conversation changes every time. Because, let's be honest, sexual abuse is a very difficult subject. And sex offenders are, well, they're the bottom of the barrel, right? They're disliked by many. They're the, you know, when people think of a sex offender, they think of the scary guy wearing a ski mask and he's driving around downtown in a white van with no windows and he's snatching kids off the street when they're on their way to school. And you know, sex offenders, once a sex offender, always a sex offender, they can't be rehabilitated. What we need to do with every sex offender throw them in prison, throw away the key. I've had many people say that. I understand where that comes from. But think about this. One out of every four girls and one out of every six boys will be the victim of sexual abuse in their lifetime. So if we multiply that out by the population of the United States, that means we have 42 million survivors of sexual abuse in the United States alone. 42 million. I've been doing this for 20 years and every time I hear statistics like that, it just stops me in my tracks. And what if I told you that out of all of them, 25% of those sex offenses are committed by kids 18 years and younger. So that means we have roughly 10 million people in this country who have been sexually abused by a child. So, what should we do? Should we take the 14-year-old boy who was prostituted out by his father when he was 10 and turned around one day and committed some of those same behaviors on his next door neighbor? Should we throw that kid in jail for the rest of his life? Or the 12-year-old whose mom leaves him and his younger siblings alone for days at a time while she's out binging on drugs. And while she's gone one night, he inappropriately touches his sister. Should we take that kid, throw him in prison and throw away the key? And so people say, well, no, obviously we can't do that with kids, but we should at least put them in jail until they're 21. Okay, so then what happens? So now we have a 21-year-old a kid who's been in prison for five or six years hardened to the ways of prison. We're gonna send them out into the community with few resources, fewer skills, and we're just gonna roll the dice and see what happens. It doesn't seem like the best plan in the world to me. So at Generations, for the past 25 years, we've served about 900 kids. And out of those 900 kids, 98% of those kids have gone on to live lives free from further sexual abuse. So 98% of these throwaway kids are now law-abiding, tax-paying citizens who are trying to raise their families just like you and I. So our options are pay for a kid to be locked up five, six, seven years, turn them loose into the community where 50 to 80% of them will commit another crime and create more victims and return to prison as an adult. 50 to 80% of juvenile justice inmates return to, adult, to return to prison by the time they're adults. We want to turn them loose into the community and then pay for them when they return to prison after they've reoffended after they've committed another crime, taxpayer money, or do we wanna take these children, put them in a place like ours that's built on relationships, that's building new skills, that's teaching them self-efficacy, where they spend one year with us and then return to the community where 98% of them do not commit these behaviors again. It seems like such a simple decision. And I'm not here really to, I'm not trying to create a commercial for generations because it, this really is beyond generations. This is, 
This is all of our kids. The kids we have at Generations are not inherently bad people. They're not evil little monsters. They're kids who came from very traumatic backgrounds, and they're kids who feel very badly about what they've done, feel a lot of shame. They know how people feel about them. They understand how the world views sex offenders. They've been told their entire lives that they're no good, that they're not going to amount to anything, that they're just a bad kid, and that's the way that they're always going to be. And it's not just the kids at Generations. We're talking today about kids in, in foster care and in child welfare overall. There are thousands of kids across our state who have been through similar experiences where they haven't had supportive adults to build stable relationships with them. And the result of that are these behaviors that we see. If we want a child welfare system that truly takes into account the welfare of our kids, then we have to establish a model that's built on the premise that all children will do well if they can. And if kids are not meeting the expectations, then it's our job as caregivers to figure out why and to try to provide that support to them so that they can be successful. We have to present opportunities for these kids to see that they can learn new skills, that they can change. And they're only going to do that through their relationships with us. It's not, just, it's not just the bad kids that we're talking about here. It's all of our kids. It's my children. It's your children. Our children are growing up in a, uh, on a, a exciting time, just a tremendous time to be a child. They have access to so many things. They all have smartphones and smart TVs and, they, and watches that tell them how many steps they've taken and you know, how long they slept. And they have internet with access to anything, Google. They have Google. I mean, Google. We didn't, I didn't, we didn't, I didn't, we didn't have Google when we were kids. If you wanted to know something, you tried to research it or you just didn't know what it was. You just never found out the answer. Now, if you need anything, you have it at your fingertips. With, but regardless of all of this technology and the advancements and everything available to our kids, if we don't help our kids feel supported enough to take the risks involved with learning and growing, then they're never going to reach their goals. Relationships are so vitally important to all of us. They provide motivation, support. Relationships are what keep us going. I worry about kids with their devices. They spend so much time glued to the electronics, and they're not developing relationships with each, with each other and with other people. And I firmly believe it's these relationships that are what give us our sense of who we are and help us to, to become the people that we can become. Relationships are honestly the best thing, the most important tool that we can give to a kid. They transcend time and space. And a perfect example of that is a, a kid that I worked with about 20 years ago. Well, I say he's a kid. He's in his late 30s now. He's not a kid, but he'll, he'll always be a kid to me. But in his late 30s, he called me recently. Um, he's been gone from generations for 20 years. He called and told me, uh, that he was having some marital problems and he thought he was going to be getting divorced and he was very upset about this and first I thought you know what, what a testimony to relationships that this child who's been gone for 20 years will call back to the group home that he was court ordered to attend that he didn't want to he didn't want to be there the first day he showed up none of them do but he was with us long enough that we were able to build those relationships, and he called back when he had trouble. So he called back and was telling me about what was happening and was distraught, just pouring his emotions over the telephone, upset about what was going to happen, how he was going to make it, how he was going to talk to his kids about it. So I listened to him talk for 10 or 15 minutes, just purely emotional. I didn't say a word. He got done talking. I started to open my mouth to be able to try to offer some reassurance and advice. Before I could say anything, he stopped me and said, 
you know what? I know this is going to be okay. Because I know that I've been through a lot of terrible things in my life, and I know I've been through a lot of hard things in my life, and I've always been able to get through it. I'm always able to get through it, so I know that this is going to be okay. That's self-efficacy. It's a simple gift, it's a free gift, and it's a gift that lasts a lifetime. Thank you.